For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, sorry to be a few minutes late getting started. Uh, lots going on, and lots were interested and excited to update you on. Uh, let's go to the first slide, please. So as we always start, let's start with our case numbers. Today, reporting just over 17,000 cases. Normally, low numbers on these Tuesdays reflecting weekend testing and case numbers, but still lower than our seven-day average, which is, I think, the trend we want to see, continuing to see this today's number, the most recent number, lower than the seven-day average, the seven-day average lower than the 14-day average. So if we look at tests, still doing a healthy number of tests, over 321,000 tests uh, uh, reported in the last reporting time period, and again, seeing downward trending 14-day test positivity at 9%. Next slide. Again, that seven-day test positivity at just under 8%, 7.9, better than the 14-day test positivity. Again, we've talked to you about some of the uncertainty in the testing numbers through the holidays. People may be not going to get tested for one reason or another. Some sites shifting over to being vaccine centers. The good news is despite all of that uncertainty, we see this stable positivity rate coming down. And looking at it over two weeks, nearly a third decrease uh, between January 12th and today. Next slide. Again, we've been focused on hospitalizations, ICU numbers. I'll get into a little bit more on the regional stay-at-home order and how that came to be lifted. But just looking at our current data, 14-day reduction in hospitalizations of over 20%, down to 17,236 individuals with COVID who are hospitalized today. And an ICU number, it always comes a little slower, comes down a little slower, uh, down by 10%, just over 10% in the past 14 days as well. Next slide. So I want to spend a little time about the regional stay-at-home order. The governor announced yesterday that all the regions, the three remaining regions in the state, had this order lifted. And I wanted to spend a moment to certainly uh, explain in a little bit more detail how those projections were made and to remind you first and foremost that the way a county came in or a region came into the stay-at-home order is different than the way they exit. We've said that um, from the beginning, that the actual projections in early December, we announced this on December 3rd, first uh, regions came into the stay-at-home order on December 6th. We explained at that point that we would use the current actual ICU data to help us guide when a region needed to come under the order, but that at, after at least three weeks after the region was under the order, that we would then look at projections for ICU capacity four weeks out. And the reason, again, that is, is because we know today's cases become hospital cases in about two weeks, ICU cases three to four weeks later. So if we want to really determine what the impact is of our current case numbers, our current transmission rates, our current test positivity on where we're going to be in the hospitals, we have to look about four weeks out. So that's why you came in in one way, we exited through the order in a different way. Next slide, please. So what we announced yesterday was all three regions, so all five regions in total across the state, were above that 15% threshold of ICU capacity four weeks out. That date would have been to February 21st. You can see here the various percentage points of where we project ICU capacity to be given current rates of transmission and what normally happens in ICUs this time of year. Those variables that you see on the right are the ones I'm going to dig into a little bit more in a moment so you see how it all comes together to make the projection. Next slide. So here we go, a, a fairly uh, detailed slide, but one that I want to spend a few minutes now going through, but also say that these slides can be made available through 
our team, my team, as well. We're working to arrange for those reporters on the line uh, a bit of a more deep dive into these elements so you understand how it comes together. But fairly quickly, we use the top line formula to project out what the COVID cases will be. We then use that along with projected new COVID admissions. I've talked to you before that the projected cases uh, two weeks afterwards become hospitalizations. So we use that formula then to look at what we predict will be the ICU admissions. Again, using that rate of transmission that are effective to help us project out what the number of cases will be. We also know that there's a discharge rate out of the intensive care unit for patients who have COVID and non-COVID patients that affect how many ICU beds will be um, occupied by individuals who are coming in and out of that um, ICU. Together, putting all of that um, into the final, the second from the bottom line to project out what the total ICU occupancy will be four weeks out, then through a what I'm just gonna call a simple math formula, projecting then the percent based on those number of beds available. And through these sort of different elements, we come to that projection. As you can see here, some of these elements can easily become uh, less reliable or unstable based on community testing, our sense of having accurate data from those tests that then drive the case numbers and the R effective. So we did, for a period of time, work to make sure over the holidays, over the Martin Luther King holiday, to make sure that our testing numbers were solid, that they were tracking with what we expected them to be on average, that we could account for any changes so that when we made a final projection, as we announced yesterday, that led to us lifting the regional stay-at-home order, they were as reliable and we could be confident in what is a fairly weighty decision for three major areas and regions of our state. Next slide. <clears throat> So what does that formula show us? You could see this on this uh, uh, graph. The sort of pointy line is what we've actually experienced over the past uh, month, month and a half. And the solid line going down is what we see with the current projections. As you can see sort of at the peak of this mountain looking graph, you can see that it's already started to come down in our actuals. Those are the numbers that we present to you each and every day. And then the solid line, again, the projections coming down to a place over the course of February, the sort of far right of this graph, the end of February showing uh, where we expect to be with those total ICU projections across the state. Next slide. What we've also seen, and you've seen a graph like this before, we call it our epidemiologic curve. This is where we look at exactly when tests were done, when they turned positive, to try to really get a more fine-tuned level of uh, or vision into what's happening into our communities. Um, and this shows this rapid line of increase towards the sort of middle and end of November, and then beginning to see some decrease now um, a few weeks after, or many weeks now after the regional stay-at-home order was put in place. This is exactly what we'd hope to see, that sort of blunting or the flattening of the curve. You see that, but only after what has was a very difficult time where we saw that rapid increase all the way through that Thanksgiving holiday into the early parts of December manifest in hospitalizations at the end of December and early January, that period where we have referred to it as that darkest part of our surge, the most difficult time that we are certainly still contending with today in terms of who's remaining in our hospital, but thank God bringing down those case numbers and the admissions overall. Next slide. Uh, this graph is also to show you the impact on our effective. We've talked about our effective many, many times, explained it as one of those details that helps us understand the rate of transmission. Remember when your R effective is above one, it essentially means that you're expanding 
the level of transmission, it's growing, not just one to one, but one to 1.5, one to one to two, sort of it's growing a bit more. Uh, when you be, go below one, that means that your transmission is shrinking. You'll see on the left side, the first uh, pink to green transition was that summer surge that we dealt with where we began to do certain things like restrict indoor activities, do some closures of some sectors where it was difficult to mask 100% of the time. And we saw a fairly swift decline in the R effective and then into that green space where we saw a period of time being below one, meaning shrinking transmission. If you look at the right side of this figure, you see the rapid increase in R effective uh, starting in October, and then the implementation of our regional stay at home order and some other modifications, which we believe leads to this quite rapid, frankly, the most steep decline of R effective. And now into a level where our R effective isn't just below one, but continues to drop the statewide R effective in a range between. 0.85 to 0.95 at the moment, which is good news. We want to see it go even lower if we can. Next slide. This shows also the impact of the regional stay-at-home order and what we were worried about if we hadn't done something like the regional stay-at-home order as regards to COVID admissions and emergency room visits. So the top line looking at what happened, you see this vertical line, the red line right around descent, early December, where the regional stay-at-home order went into place. And then roughly three, uh, two to three weeks later, you begin to see a slowing down of that upward slope and then a flattening and now a reduction. So almost what I'm gonna say COVID textbook now in the ability to say you put an intervention in place, even if it isn't uh, our, our residents aren't 100% compliant with it. Even if it's difficult always to measure compliance, just the notion that these interventions come into place, three weeks later, you see that uh, beginning flattening, and then uh, even later, you begin to see the reductions, and that's what we experienced here. The good news is we've seen highs almost near 4,000 admissions a day into our hospitals because of, because of COVID, now seeing days below 2,500 and even getting lower, which is exactly what's gonna keep our hospital conditions improving and our ICU capacity as high as it can be. Next slide, please. And this is what I'll say a punchline slide. If we look at what we were worried about, in terms of total number of admissions. Here you can see that uh, with the regional stay-at-home order tracking with the, the white solid line, the level of concern we had tracking with the linear upward sloping red line that uh, in essence, we were concerned that we could be without mitigation, without the benefits of things like the regional stay-at-home order and the hard work that I think many Californians put in in the month of December, staying at home when they can, reducing their mis mixing, wearing their mask a little bit more than maybe they were before, especially around that Thanksgiving period. And then frankly, making some hard decisions. I know I made them um, to not mix with our families, to hold more low key uh, events over the holidays with our household that we think that that meaningfully decreased up to 25,000 hospital admissions, 5,000 ICU admissions, if you look at the right-sided graph, which not only protect our health system, but translate into real lives saved across our state. And frankly, many of our family members who are vulnerable, I think these decisions help protect them and save lives. Next slide, please. So as we sort of move beyond the regional stay-at-home order, and again, remind you that uh, those slides are available to you, uh, we are happy to continue to dig into the details so that all, all, all those who are interested in the detail get that information in a timely way. Uh, but looking back now, people often ask me what the last year has been like, and I'll just remind you that uh, we mark over the course of yesterday and today really 
uh, a one year later moment uh, after the first two cases of COVID were discovered, uh, reported, I should say, to California Department of Public Health, really when we were still trying to understand what COVID-19 was, um, how coronavirus was gonna shape our lives. And I wanna just take a moment to acknowledge that there's been a measurable loss in this last year. Over 30, 37,500 Californians have lost their life it also has shaped a number of our households, our families, our communities in ways. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the challenge that we've all gone through. And although uh, we are working through with vaccines and other things, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I just want to take a moment to just share my own sadness and condolences with all those families, uh, all those communities who have lost loved ones, who've had their uh, uh, sort of world torn apart and turned over because of this disease. And our ability to continue to do those uh, actions ourselves and as communities to make sure that we reduce the lives lost, that we reduce the future impact of COVID cannot be overstated. And as we look back at the last 12 months and we look forward to the next many, uh, we keep those loved ones in our hearts and prayers uh, so that they can get through what is uh, specifically a very difficult time. Next slide. So again, we know that COVID fatigue, just sort of building on what I just said, uh, that it's not a moment to take down our guard in any way. That exiting the stay at home order uh, means for most of us going into the purple tier. I think 99% of our population in California is now in uh, the purple tier of the blueprint. I'll update that in a moment, but that's also a fairly uh, restrictive level of uh, movement, of mixing, and that we hope Californians don't see yesterday's announcement as a let's go and put our guard down, but let's still firmly keep our guard up. Let's do what we can to make sure that our rates don't increase and rise, that although our hospital delivery system is uh, looking uh, better, looking like it can manage what is coming its way, which is ultimately what we want all Californians to get the care that they need when they need it in our hospitals, not just but for COVID, but for so many other things, that in order to keep that the case, we need to keep our guard up and follow these simple but important actions. Next slide. So as we exit the regional stay-at-home order, as I said, we go right back to the blueprint for a safer economy. We have continued to run on a weekly basis, even if we don't publicize it on press conferences and updates, the tiers. And so today, uh, as I've indicated, 54 counties are in purple, three in red, one in orange, and zero in yellow. No counties based on transmission rates and test positivity are moving, uh, should say case rates and test positivity are moving forward. We have a few counties that uh, sort of meet that one week metric to move forward. Remember, we have to watch, you have to stay in your tier a minimum of three weeks, but you need to meet the next less restrictive tiers metrics for two weeks before moving. So we have a few counties that show promise with their metrics moving towards the le less restrictive tier and at least one county whose uh, metrics show that they might move to a more restrictive tier. But we'll keep you updated on a weekly basis. We run that data on Monday, post it and share it with you on Tuesdays and look forward to continuing to do that moving forward. Next slide. So again, what does it mean that we've returned to the blueprint for a safer economy? You know, my own kids ask me, well, what does it mean that we are removing the regional stay-at-home order? What does it mean that I can do that I couldn't before? Well, I know this resonates for my kids who miss their friends dearly. That means they can go, potentially go out to eat, uh, enjoy a restaurant outdoors, still physically distanced, still keeping your face covering on as much as possible, but an event that I know many people miss. Get your hair cut, your nails done. Um, certainly, uh, you've all become familiar enough with me that that isn't my issue with the haircut, but I know many of you look forward to going back fully masked to your salon or barbershop to 
get a haircut. Um, and then for kids, and this is real one for my household, explaining that the park uh, across the street that they can go and play Frisbee with their mask on and see a friend um, uh, that they've missed for many, many weeks now. And I know that my four little ones are looking forward to that. And I'm sure many of you, not just your kids and your young family members, but all of us alike. Next slide. So now I wanna move into a conversation building upon the important work that we've been updating on vaccine distribution to amplify a bit of what the governor discussed yesterday in his press conference, uh, to, to talk about what we've done in the last seven weeks. And it's no small feat to get 2.5 million Californians vaccinated in seven weeks working hard with the healthcare delivery system on the backs of public health departments that have been heroic in so many ways, balancing issues of testing and contact tracing, working through the tiering system in the regional stay-at-home order, supporting their health departments, um, their health systems through the surge, but also valiantly working to make sure vaccine distribution happens without a hitch. And although we know that uh, things have been slower than we liked. We did do recently a 10-day challenge where we set a goal. We worked with our counties and all the providers across the state to really challenge ourselves to increase vaccine distribution. It was also an opportunity and we went into it with a frame of learning. I've always said, I wanna be part of a state team that we're the fastest learners about COVID. Uh, COVID is like an opponent we've never seen before. We don't have game film about what it's gonna do. And so we need to learn and uh, learn quickly and adapt those learnings into our real operations. So we used those 10 days to really learn a great number of things. And while getting those lessons in place, we tripled our pace of vaccine administration, going from 40,000 roughly vaccines done on a weekday to over 125,000 done on weekdays today, all in the course of 10 days. Uh, I think we learned a tremendous amount. I wanna thank all of our partners at the county level across our different vaccine partnerships that did a tremendous amount of work, not just in those 10 days, but over the past week, especially this last weekend, to get data entered into systems so we can capture the full essence, the full level of work that we have done across the state on vaccines. So before we uh, transition to the next slide, I wanna uh, introduce many of you, you've heard her name. She is a, a friend, a colleague, a tremendous leader for the state, Secretary Yolanda Richardson. Uh, this is a, a, a colleague of mine that I've gotten to know, especially over the last year, but she has this long track record of, uh, I think, greater than 25 years experience working both in the private and the public sector, leading the way on healthcare projects of meaning, working with local health plans in San Francisco, leading an effort with Covered California, arguably the most uh, distinguished and successful uh, statewide health exchange, implementing that program from the formative days to put us on the map, let us work for all vulnerable and other Californians to get healthcare services to them. And then uh, really over the last year, uh, Secretary Richardson and her team uh, were key partners in getting our Valencia branch lab, our COVID testing lab down in Southern California built. The whole build out of that in record time uh, on budget was really a, a, a force of Yolanda's leadership and the great work that she does every day, bringing her now to partner with all of us, making this an all of state government effort to bring and accelerate our vaccine uh, distribution plan while still maintaining and focusing on the key values and principles that have guided our entire response to COVID. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Secretary Richardson to share with you some of the details of what we've learned and where we're going from here. Thank you so much, Dr. Galley, for that introduction. and. Let me just start by saying I'm so honored that the governor asked me to bring some additional operations thinking to the vaccine distribution uh, 
strategy statewide so that we can get vaccine off the shelves and to arms quickly, safely, and fairly. Um, I definitely want to thank um, my colleague, Dr. Galley, for all of his work, as well as the public health officials across the state that have done groundbreaking uh, work to guide the prioritization of COVID vaccine, focusing on the who and the when. But let's talk about my job. My job is to focus on the how. How do we expand our efforts statewide in partnership with our local health partners and the broader health system? Um, I wanna make sure that we can scale up um, so that when more vaccine is available, Californians can access that infrastructure, but also how do we optimize the supply that we have now? So I am so looking forward to working with you, Dr. Galley, on that effort. Next slide, please. Oh, we're there. Um, so let's talk about what we've learned. So Dr. Galley talked a little bit about the 1 million challenge, and we've, we've learned some things. Definitely what worked um, and definitely some areas that needed improvement. Um, the first thing is the simplification of the eligibility framework. Californians were understandably confused by mixed messages, variability of eligibility across the state, when, to, when it's in my turn, who's going next. And so yesterday the governor announced a statewide eligibility framework that will make it easier for Californians to understand who is eligible to make an appointment to get vaccinated. Also, we know who the vaccine has been allocated to, and you hear a lot about that. But reporting back to the state and to Californians about who has been vaccinated is a very, very important data element, but that has been a challenge. So the governor also shared uh, about a tool called MyTurn, which will be a key tool in addressing that challenge, helping us to standardize vaccine information and data so we can make sure that the people who need to get vaccinated are getting vaccinated. And lastly, we need to address the supply. We understand that vaccine supply is limited, but we also need to address that the supply we have now needs to get administered as quickly as possible. So we're developing an approach that allows us to do just that safely and equitably and quickly but also allows us to scale up when there's more supply available. Next slide, please. So what are we doing about that? We're building a statewide vaccine administration network. We're thinking of tapping into the expertise and experience of a third party administrator to make vaccine distribution more efficient and giving us the state and all of the Californians more, visit more visibility in what's actually happening on the ground. That network is going to include public health systems, pharmacies, uh, public hospitals, community clinics, pop-ups and mobile sites, and will include partnerships like with our labor partners, which will have an immediate focus on allocating to those who are vaccinating quickly and safely. So again, we can get out the supply that we do have in the state of California. But as the supply grows, we're going to double down and focus on expanded fixed and mobile sites, making sure that, again, all Californians have access to that infrastructure. Our local health partners are going to continue to play such a key and important role, but not just as providers, but also as our partners in helping to ensure that we're reaching disproportionately affected communities effectively and in a way that matters. Most important, this whole underlying approach is going to continue to advance the principles of equity. And Dr. Galley is gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Next slide. So I mentioned the My Turn tool. It's a new statewide tool that's easier for providers to maintain their uh, health records and report the administration of doses quickly. And so it's also available to Californians. So if you go to myturn.ca.gov, you'll have an opportunity to enter information and learn when it's your turn. And if it's not your turn, you can get notified when it is. Now, let's be reasonable. Because vaccine is so limited, if you use that tool right now, you're going to see that you're not eligible. But it is an opportunity for when you are to get notified as soon as that is available. It's also a scheduling tool. And so the we are partnering with Los Angeles and San Diego 
um, to try that out and, and get all of the kinks out and then roll that out in the coming weeks to other counties as well. My turn will become a robust and valuable tool for the people of California. And so as more and more people use it, we wanna make sure that we continue to collect information on how we can make that the most user-friendly tool for Californians available. Next slide. So our overarching approach to operations is we wanna make sure that nothing slows down the administration of vaccine other than the pace in which vaccine arrives in the state. And we're gonna do that by balancing safety, speed and equity while scaling up to meet the level of vaccine needed in the state. So again, I am just honored to be a partner with Dr. Galley on this effort and look forward to working with all of our many partners. Back to you, Dr. Galley. Secretary Richardson, thank you. And thanks for your leadership and not just what you've done over the past few weeks, um, you know, sleepless nights working with partners to get data right and figuring out the path forward, but just the tremendous work I know you and our teams collectively will be doing with our local partners. Next slide. We found it fitting to punctuate just this part on vaccines and frankly, our entire presentation today with a focus on equity. California has led uh, on equity in so many ways. We're the first state to come up with an equity metric, apply it to our blueprint uh, through a lot of questions and concerns. I think we've really stuck to that and tried to build up testing and contact tracing and isolation and quarantine efforts focused on so many of our deeply impacted communities and business sectors where Californians work and put their lives on the line and how do we make sure that we protect those communities as much as we can. And although we can always do more, we have strived to do our best on so many of those areas. And with vaccines, it's important to wrap this segment up by reminding us that equity is a focus, that yes, speed and safety are very important, that making sure communities that have been deeply impacted, scarred by COVID, that those with active outbreaks and great levels of transmission are prioritized for vaccines, that this happens through our allocation framework, that our teams at California Health and Human Services and California Department of Public Health with all of our local partners, to me, the community experts on the ground who know what's up and what's happening and how we can work to make sure not just that the amount of vaccine gets allocated proportional to that impact, but also that we have the right partners, that we set those partnerships up right, that we work with our trusted advisors and communities to make sure that the statewide network, which S Secretary Richardson described, is more or less uh, working as to the best of its capabilities, leveraging those community uh, messengers and knowledge bases to make sure that those most impacted people and families and communities get this vaccine in the fastest way possible. I also wanna say that we don't wanna have equity and speed at odds to one another. Uh, it's an important equity principle to get those who are disproportionately impacted vaccine quickly. It is a tool that not only gets us as a state to that community immunity number or figure that we know creates a level of protection we all want and need, but also that it helps us support vulnerable people for when uh, transmission rates, if they do go back up, that we create a protection, a bubble around those most vulnerable. So not only do we protect our healthcare delivery system, but we continue to be focused on saving lives. This comes, as I said, through our allocation framework, but also through how we support providers through compensation and other technical assistance in key communities across the state to deliver vaccine. And then of course, ensuring that we have real-time data that we look at race and ethnicity, zip code, community level data to make sure our efforts are paying off and making adjustments all the long way to keep equity there in our forefront. Next slide. So as we always do before we turn it over to the reporters and both Secretary Richardson and I are happy to be here and answer as many questions as we can. 
just want to remind us that, yes, it is a team sport fighting COVID, that it's only together can we slow the spread and this pandemic, get vaccines together out into our communities to the level that we hope to send that clear message that California is ready to our federal partners, bring more vaccine here. We want to get our residents vaccinated. And while we keep our guard up to not just protect our hospital systems and our communities of health professionals, but also to keep the impact on currently, uh, you know, ravished and other communities across the state to a minimum. So with that, I'll turn it over for the first question. Catherine Ho, San Francisco Chronicle. Hi, um, on on vaccinations, we're still hearing from counties and, and providers that the biggest thing stopping them from vaccinating more people is that they just don't know how many doses they're going to get week to week um, allocated from the state. Do you know when exactly that process is going to get a little smoother, a little more predictable? I mean, I know we get allocations from the federal government, but now that we have a new administration in Washington, when do you anticipate that that's going to get a little bit better? Yeah, thanks for the question. Secretary Richardson, would you take that one? Absolutely, absolutely Dr. Galley. Yes, we continue to hear that being a problem. Predictability is certainly something we would all like to know. Um, our administration is definitely in contact with the new administration, letting them know that, you know, advance notice is definitely going to help with the distribution. So I think that uh, we've had a very clear voice um, and we don't know that at this time when that's going to change, but definitely making sure that they understand that's something we are all looking forward to. Ron Lynn, Los Angeles Times. Hey, Dr. Galley, thanks so much for taking our questions. Uh, two questions for you today, uh, one on the pace of the real thing and second on this, some emerging criticism of your decisions. First, um, uh, thanks for those charts uh, at the beginning of your remarks, but can you address the concern that you're opening too fast and that it would be better to wait until cases lower even more and more vaccines are out? Second, some local elected officials have begun accusing the state's past actions as not being based on science. In particular, some have pointed to your comments um, on December 8th, where you said of the decision to close outdoor dining, quote, really has to do with the goal of trying to keep people at home, not a comment on the relative safety of outdoor dining, end quote. Some elected officials have interpreted that to mean that the closures of outdoor dining were not based on science, is safe, and may be backfired because people who couldn't dine outdoors then gather at home indoors. These officials are dubious the ban worked because cases, hospitalizations, and deaths worsened even after the stay-at-home order was imposed. Can you respond to these questions? Was your previous ban on outdoor dining and the rest of the stay-at-home order based on science? Did it backfire in worsening the surge, or did it in fact save us from forcing California to having to ration hospital care? Thanks so much. Yeah, Ron, I'll try to remember all the parts of that question. Thanks for offering it. Going to the first part, uh, you know, certainly we, uh, we've been looking at the data, as I explained to you, and thinking about the projections laid out to you today, how that projection's been made, waiting to make sure that our uh, data was stable, and then uh, lifting the regional stay-at-home order on pretty well-explained and pre-prescribed uh, thresholds. And so when the regions, and they all happen to cross that threshold, it's not surprising to me that they crossed the threshold around the same time because transmission rates came down pretty significantly. And we've been sharing those numbers for weeks. Uh, so I think anticipating this, uh, we, we uh, believe that we lifted it at the right time. Um, again, this was not a regional stay-at-home order based on community transmission rates only. It was really focused on what we would see in the hospitals a few weeks out. So I knew very well that we might be in the situation, even said it at some moment early on, that we may be in a situation where we're lifting the regional stay-at-home order when still hospitals have pretty high census from COVID. And that's what we're seeing now, but that's coming down. It's coming down every single day for the last um, couple of weeks. And if we project where we're going to be in four weeks, as I walked you through today, we believe we're going to be at a level of uh, concern in those facilities that is lower than where we've been, especially over the last couple of weeks. Of course, this reminds us 
and should remind us all to keep our guard up because if those rates come right back up, our hospitals are gonna have a challenging time. But we designed this order really around hospital projections, not case projections. And so um, that is that leads to the time, uh, the timing of when it was lifted. Uh, in terms of the comments that I made in the past, without getting too focused on them um, again, uh, uh, you know, so many of the things that uh, I and we say can sometimes be interpreted differently. My goal is always to try to communicate exactly the purpose of a decision or the purpose of uh, a point of communication. And uh, certainly at the time, uh, the, the decision to include outdoor dining as uh, one of the things that we were restricting was really focused on the fact that we were doing many decisions at that time to reduce overall movement and reduce overall mixing. And at that time, the relative risk and the concern about a specific sector was not so much what we were focused on only. Uh, so we were really targeting getting uh, a stay-at-home order, a regional stay-at-home order that minimized mixing, minimized movement as much as possible. Don Thompson, the Associated Press. Well, thank you. Uh, Governor Newsom has repeatedly said that uh, each county is different and deserves a county by county approach to the pandemic. Why has the state now decided to take a one size fits all approach? Or what do you hope to achieve by doing so? And mine's a multi part question, too. Who is the third party administrator? What will this change mean for people already in line for vaccines? Will the super sites like Dodger Stadium continue to operate? And turning to the ICU capacity, will those projections now be on the state's model page and updated daily? Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to take the last part of your question first and then turn it over to Secretary Richardson for the other parts. So we will continue to track um, ICU uh, level data. Uh, and sharing them and posting them. I think the background on the projections is going to be useful to everyone. And then you can contextualize what we will be posting on a move forward basis. Again, I want to be clear that we did lift the regional stay at home order. There are not conditions or parameters to re enter the regional stay at home order. All that said, we continue to watch not just the hospital numbers, not just the ICU numbers, all of the numbers we've been tracking through the blueprint and beyond to make sure that California makes real-time decisions based on the conditions that we're seeing in our communities. And we uh, will continue to work with our local public health partners to make sure if and when the time comes uh, that we have to make other decisions around restrictions or other elements that we're able to do that and posting the data data and sharing that very clearly and publicly will help make those decisions down the road and in the future a little easier. Uh, Secretary Richardson. Thank you, Dr. Galli. To the question around standardization, you know, we really want to focus on eligibility requirements so that people across the state understand when it's their turn. We will continue to work with counties who will have two roles both as providers, definitely understanding their particular communities and providing the strategies that they think will reach their communities best, but also being our partner and advising us on how to do that across the state, so making a more global approach. With regard to uh, places like Dodger Stadium and mega sites, we're definitely looking forward to partnering with people to make sure that those sites are effective in reaching those communities. Again, this is about uh, the broader view. And so those are just going to be one aspect of the strategies that we employ. There will be other things that we will do, including using our health partners to identify strategies around mobile clinics and, and other things such as that. Um, and then I believe your last question was about the TPA. We are in discussion with many uh, individuals and partners to talk about how this might work. And when we have more information about that, we will definitely be making an announcement at that time. Thank you. Jocelyn Moran, CBS 47 Fresno. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask about vaccine distribution here in the Central Valley. Um, Fresno County, for example, had to close its mass vaccination site for first doses because there just isn't enough vaccine and they need to ensure they have enough second doses for those who receive the first. Um, the Fresno County Health Department says they have the ability to administer 
um, 30,000 doses a week, if not more, but they only received about 8,000 doses last week, um, the county health department did. So I was just wondering, what is the communication um, you are having with Central Valley counties as a big priority here is getting essential workers, farm workers vaccinated? Um, and when can Central Valley counties expect a significant increase in the uh, amount of doses they're receiving? Thank you. Secretary Richardson. I do appreciate the question and understand that we continue to hear about the frustration on the limited supply. I'm not specifically aware of Fresno County specific situation, but definitely because you have highlighted that, we'll definitely reach out to them to work on um, how they're going to be able to serve their community. So thank you for definitely highlighting that for us. Doug Sovereign, KCBS Radio. Hi, Dr. Talley and Secretary Richardson. Thanks so much for taking my, my question. A um, couple things. One is, um, can you identify, like, what is the single biggest thing that is slowing down the distribution that has a couple million doses still sitting in freezers or wherever they are? That, what is it that the third-party administrator is going to do to, to break that logjam? And then second of all, can you explain on Sunday, for example, the Bay Area had 7-point-something percent ICU capacity as of noon with no projection of reaching 15% within four weeks. But that afternoon, it went to 23% capacity. And a few hours later, the projection was that it would hit 25% within four weeks. And of course, the orders were lifted. Now it's back down, last I checked, in the 8% range. What happened? How does that happen? How does it swing so volatilely? And what does that say about um, the reliability of the projections that within a few hours, you could go from, uh, we're not going to have 15% to, oh, well, we're going to have 25%. Thanks a lot. Yeah, let me take the, the second half and then turn it over to Secretary Richardson for the first half of your question. Um, you know, again, part of what our concern has been over the last many days and frankly, a couple of weeks is the stability of the data on the projections, making sure that we have a clear understanding of what the true bed count is within each of the regions that are available ICU beds, not just are they available because the bed is there, but they are actually staffable and a patient can actually benefit from that bed. So really trying to nail that down to get it uh, more accurate has been a key uh, key issue uh, that we have worked through. And I think because of the greater stability recently of the data, we felt comfortable um, because uh, with those swings, obviously there's uncertainty, but as we've seen those swings level out a bit, uh, we have uh, we, we felt more comfortable doing the lift of the regional state home order yesterday, as opposed to doing the same thing uh, five or six days ago, even if the data sort of pointed to that, but with that instability and that concern. Uh, I will get you some specific remarks about the swing that you're talking about specifically. Uh, I don't wanna o overstep or overspeak uh, without all of the details about that, but if we can follow up afterwards, we'll have our team send you some uh, additional points about the Bay Area numbers at that period of time. Secretary Richardson. Thank you. Um, on the question of uh, the supply distribution, we are working with our local health partners to move supply to our healthcare providers across the state to make sure that we're leveraging um, those partners and those providers that can get it out more effectively and efficiently. And, and definitely the TPA is, is an opportunity to leverage both healthcare delivery system expertise and, and have some expertise around scale. This is again about California being prepared uh, to make sure that we can get out the, the vaccine when more supply is available. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Brandon Lewis, Channel 8, San Diego. Hi, right, thank you for taking my question. Um, I have a question on two topics. The first is, will the state work backwards by age to vaccinate? And how do you respond to criticism from younger workers who are in phase 1B, tier 2, like those with uh, in the commercial industry or underlying conditions who were supposed to get vaccinated sooner and now maybe push toward the end of the line and had no opportunity to provide feedback on this? Um, and second, we're getting some tips from vaccinators about people who they believe are from Mexico or out of the state with suspicious health care documents, but they have to let them anyway because there's no residency requirements. So why isn't the state requiring vaccinators to provide 
proof of residency to combat fraud or vaccine tourism? Yeah, I'll start on this question and turn it over to Secretary Richardson for any additional thoughts. Um, you know, I think the, the first part of your question, uh, certainly at this moment of scarcity, our focus is to ensure that uh, we have that balance between risk and exposure. And we make sure that vaccines are not just used as a tool to get to community immunity or herd immunity, as some people call it, but also to ensure that the most vulnerable uh, from getting uh, COVID and those who are likely to need hospitalizations, ICU care, or God forbid, pass away from COVID, that we protect those individuals with vaccine as early as we can, especially with the supply challenges that we have. Hopefully moving forward and that number one lever is working to show that California is ready to vaccinate our population, accept additional supply and get all Californians lined up and, and vaccinated. Uh, we certainly uh, are listening to a lot of feedback, making what I would say are difficult decisions, but trying to make sure that they're clear and simple to follow. Using a age-based framework helps us get there, but also recognizing that that targeted outreach, that allocation formula and opportunity helps us reach other populations, not just on age, but on exposure, to ensure that those populations are taken care of. Um, I do think that younger individuals who are in professions or in situations where they aren't nearly as exposed as some of the other high exposure industries will end up um, waiting a little longer than others who have either high risk or high exposures to, uh, to uh, COVID risk factors. So there, of course, is gonna be some po sectors of our population that don't come to the front of the line as quickly as some others. And we're working through to make sure that that communication is simple, well understood, because the worst thing is when people don't know where they are in the line and trying to communicate that as clearly as possible. I think there's a real opportunity through the work that Secretary Richardson's leading to make sure that simple, clear sense of where people are will be communicated based on the hard work that our public health leaders have put into place to describe the when for many, many Californians. Secretary Richardson, anything to add? I would just um, echo what you said, Dr. Galley, is that we will be making sure that we work closely with you and your team to make sure that our strategies align with the goals to reach the populations that we target. David Baker, Bloomberg News. Doctors, I, um, there were two things that I wanted to ask about, both related to vaccinations and the federal government. First, we're hearing that the federal government is now telling the states that they are going to be getting more vaccination doses next week, but not necessarily as many as we need right now. What is the latest that you've heard from them on how many we're going to receive here in California? And then related to that, we've also heard that uh, the conference call between governors and the White House on the coronavirus is starting up again under the new administration today. Who is handling that from the White House end? Who within the administration are you getting to, to deal with directly on these issues? Secretary Richardson, do you want to answer at least the first part? I can come back uh, and answer the second if you would like. Yeah, we, we're, we're hearing the same information about, um, you know, the increase in allocation. You know, our notification of that process is a very short notification period. And so um, answering that question is difficult to do. Um, we don't because we don't know at this moment how much we'll get. But, you know, we are grateful for any additions that we get in the vaccine so that we can definitely meet the supply, more of the supply needs that we know um, have been a challenge uh, for our providers. Dr. Galley. Sure. And, and uh, you know, we have had, even when the new administration was transitioning in, we had periodic conversations about trying to understand what the new shift and transition would look like. And so we will continue those. 
uh, both the the COVID leadership, but then focused on testing or vaccinations. There's specific point people within uh, President Biden's team who uh, have responsibility and interaction with the state on our team will continue a consistent cadence of both uh, larger scale conversations with all states, some conversations I'm sure with the Western partners, uh, Region 9, FEMA Region 9, to make sure that we're aligned and, and hearing the same and preparing the same way. And then as always, direct communications with individuals within the Biden administration to ensure that we're implementing and working together on plans to get vaccines rolled out. So those communications have been ongoing, will continue, and we look forward to increasing the cadence to make sure the needs of Californians are heard loud and clear, and we're able to fill the pressing uh, demands on vaccines as quickly as possible. Rody Levesque, L.A. Blade. Hey, Dr. Galley. Uh, my colleagues answered all four of my questions, but I do have a couple more. Um, looking at the speed of the U.K. variant and some of the concerns that I've heard from Dr. Fauci and from the Centers for Disease Control and some of my colleagues reporting on this, how big of a problem is this going to be? And also, we've heard some rumblings that Moderna is saying they may be necessary for a third dose and a couple of the other variants. I realize those are generalized questions, but I've been making notes, so thanks to my colleagues on the call because you guys got my questions answered. Dr. Galley? Great. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll take a stab at yours, Brody. Um, so first, you know, variants in general are concerned right? We really do, uh, you know, the variant of a virus is a sw slight tweak in the genetic sequence in that sort of blueprint for the virus, that if it's done exactly the wrong way, I'll put it, it can create some resistance to our typical antibodies, resistance to some other uh, tools in our toolkit to fight this pandemic. So, of course, we're very concerned. We know that we have cases, both the UK variant and um, recently discovered other variants that you've heard about from UCSF and Cedar sinai and other parts of the state. So we're watching that very, very closely. Thankfully, we have relatively low number of cases today, but it does require us to keep our guard up. I mean, this is a, if the variant is faster and more transmissible, if it becomes more virulent in a way, um, of course, that gives us great concern. With regards to, and, and I'll say, we'll guide the response to the rest of the pandemic. If we see trends that are concerning, of course, we'll be communicating with all of you as quickly as we see those trends, working with the local partners to make sure we put the right decisions in place to protect Californians and keep us moving to the other side other side of the pandemic. With regards to whether a third dose of Moderna is needed, um, I'm not sure if that's the case. Uh, certainly we'll look into that right after this. Have not heard it myself, uh, but we'll check with the rest of the team uh, to determine if that is something we have to plan for uh, and, and we'll keep you posted if we do. Vicki Gonzalez, KCRA. Hello. Um, I'm going to focus on youth and schools. Um, any update on youth sports uh, across California? We're getting lots of messages from families. And then also, in addition, um, we're getting some word that some school districts who are planning some kind of in-person learning will no longer be able to do so due to um, a new requirement, a four-foot rule that under no circumstances should distance between the student chairs be less than four feet. Um, is this a CDC requirement? And, and I guess what led to this? change for school? Yeah, no, thank you for the questions, Vicki. Um, on the first one with youth sports, uh, yesterday also marked a day, it was a planned day where uh, certain uh, sports, certain activities, uh, especially youth sports, could begin both with uh, preparation, conditioning, practice, and competition. That is listed on the CDPH website. You can see things like cross country, track and field, certain other sports that are largely held outside 
or not largely exclusively held outside with significant distance between participants, whether they're practicing or competing, and then flowing through the rest of the blueprint as to where other sports and other activities fall in the blueprint. You can find that on the CDPH website. Yes, that's my way of saying I haven't memorized every single place where every single sport is, but you can see that. Uh, you can see that there. And it really follows the sense of um, whether it's outdoors versus indoors, whether you can keep physically distanced, whether you can be masked during part of the practice or competition, all of those things at play to sort of lay out a plan with those very important activities. I'll tell you that my kids can't wait. They're probably going to go themselves to try to figure out where their favorite activity falls so they can plan and begin. And we continue to work with stakeholders to make sure we get it right, that we understand the conditions given the evolving pandemic so that we can uh, uh, we can sort of guide us through this pretty difficult time. With regards to the four feet versus three feet rule um, uh, and, and uh, the, the physical distancing between students, we're working hard to make sure that uh, schools with plans that are already in place, demonstrating the ability to track transmission and safety are, uh, uh, you know, continued. We want to support all schools and their plans to bring students back to in-person education, uh, providing uh, a significant amount of resources in the last many weeks, focused on testing, focused on PPE, focused on setting up classrooms in a certain way. And we're working through exactly this question about the four feet versus three feet versus some other, uh, other issues. And the hope is that we work with all uh, education leaders to make sure these rules uh, uh, or these these concepts really help facilitate that safe and secure return to school, but don't inhibit and um, slow down some of the important plans that have been already in place. Final question, Ann Barry Jester, Kaiser Health News. Hi, Secretary Scali and Richardson. Thanks so much for your time. Um, uh, two questions, quick ones. Uh, the first one is that all but a handful of states have released more information on vaccine administration than California, whether it's providing information by county, age, or race, um, or the share of healthcare workers that have been vaccinated. When will the state release more granular data? And then I wanted to make sure I understood something about today's announcement. It sounds like you don't yet have a third-party administrator in place, but I'm curious when you plan to start distributing vaccines via this new centralized method. Thank you. Secretary Richardson. Thank you for the question. Absolutely, granular data is a, is a key priority for us in the next few weeks, and we're certainly gonna be working with our providers um, and this vaccine network to make sure that we identify what is the key information we want in providing those analytics. And so we will continue to post information over time as we receive it. Um, and then as, and as soon as we have more information about the third party administrator in terms of uh, making an announcement about who that will be and, and what the what what the scope of their work will be. We'll definitely be sharing that. So uh, again, I want to just thank everyone for their patience over an hour, a lot of information today, hopefully give you a sense of uh, how we've made some of the decisions up until now on both the regional stay at home order and, and with vaccines and, and uh, hope on where we're heading. Of course, this is gonna depend on us continuing to work with our federal partners. We sure hope that the message about increasing vaccines is one that will continue, that it's not just a one week uh, issue and that we will begin to increase that pace of vaccines in the state because that supply from our federal partners will increase. So with that, I'll just uh, thank you again, uh, commemorating really a year of COVID uh, and uh, hopefully months with uh, reductions in cases and more vaccines to really support our state to get to the other side. Appreciate the partnership, appreciate what all of you do to help communicate and you yourself choose to, to help protect our, our entire state from COVID. And with that, I uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org coronavirus.